Well, welcome back to another episode of The Wild Way, where we want to inspire every man to live with eternal purpose every day. Charles, because we believe that if you find your why, you find your way. There we go. So we're here to find our way and find our why. And we have the opportunity today to talk to one of the greatest, one of the heavy hitters in our community. The giant. The man, the myth, the legend, Henry Noy. He's a father, a husband, an ordained minister, a lawyer, Esquire Noy. And uh, man, if you if you don't have a piece of paper or a note open, now's your chance. Now is your time. Once we get started, you're gonna want to take notes. You're gonna want to go back to re-listen to this. And we're just really excited to get to hear from his story. And Henry is the quintessential definition of still waters often run deep. Mm. And so we are just super thankful to have him here with us today. And we're testing this out first time virtual, but you know, not even a global pandemic is gonna stop this conversation. So really excited. And welcome yeah. to the Wild Way, Henry. All right, thank you guys very much for having me. Very excited to be here. Yeah, so thankful that you you can make it <laughs> with us that virtually. you made time for the little folks like us. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Remember the people, <laughs> the little people in life. The little people. <laughs> <laughs> Henry, yeah. well, we have the, the, the honor and the pleasure to know you from our church community. Uh, but for people that don't know you, can you give us just uh, an intro to who you are? And we'll get into your story uh, more just as we go throughout. So who are you, Henry? <laughs> oh, wow. So, I mean, you guys know this. And so for the benefit of the podcast is um, every question to me is a loaded question because uh, these 52 years I've lived have been extremely atypical. So um, looking back on who I am now, um, I try to live every day to glorify God. I don't believe there's a dividing line between who I am secularly as a lawyer, who I am sort of, you know, in faith as a minister. I'm Henry. And I think that uh, um, you know, I'm called to, to make his name great in every uh, definition of my life. So as you said, I'm a husband, I'm a father, you know, I'm, I'm still a sibling. Uh, you know, I try to be active in the community. So whatever, whatever, however, you know, I manifest this, this sort of shade of Henry. Um, I'm just trying to make his name great. And I try to be authentic. I try to be real. I've had, as we're going to get into, a very uh, atypical life experience. And I think that, um, you know, I hated it when I was younger because everything was always so different. But I think I'm at the sweet spot of life that I'm able to sort of, and I, you know, I shared this with you guys before, but now I feel like I need, I'm, I'm in a position where I get to look back mm. on life so that guys like you can look ahead. And so I find great honor in that. Um, I find I'm coming into the season of like purpose. I, I think where it makes sense a little bit because a lot of the things that we're gonna talk about in that moment did not make sense. Uh, so I am, I'm, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, I'm at that nice intersection between still having, you know, some age and vitality, uh, but with some wisdom from living. Mm -hmm. And I'm really looking forward to, you know, chopping up with y'all today. Awesome. You definitely bring the wisdom. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> so while we're still at the beginning, we'd like to get like an overall arc of, our, uh, our guest story. So uh, let's just start at the beginning. Where are you from and what was it like just growing up? Right. So anybody who knows me, I'm proud uh, to say I'm from Birmingham, Alabama. I roll tide 1000 percent. So I was born in Birmingham, Alabama uh, in the urban part. Uh, Birmingham is actually the largest city. We're over 200 something thousand you know, people in Birmingham proper. So it's a city. Mm. It's just in the south. Uh, both of my parents were married previously. Even that, as I say, everything in my life is a, is a story because my father was actually 63 when I was born. Oh, wow. So I grew up with a father who was an amazing man. I feel like in my life, I'm sandwiched between two of the most uh, amazing uh, men that I share DNA with, my father and my son. Mm -hmm. and I guess we'll talk about him. But so I grew up in the South, older parents. Both my parents were married before. They had children. My father had six kids before. My mother had five kids before. Together they had three, and I was the last of, of all of them. Mm. Uh, so, you know, my father was retired my entire life. My mother uh, was a homemaker. So we never had a lot of money. Um, but uh, I grew up in, 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 a, in a community that was very tight, very sort of, I think, unfortunately different than it is now. I had a great upbringing. I didn't know I was poor until high school. <laughs> Uh, but uh, we were, but uh, it, the, the things that I got from, from my, I'm like, um, I'm so shaped by, by him because, uh, and it's so funny, the craziest thing is that I, I, I'm channeling him. 
<laughs> because I mean, we go to church together, you guys know. So I, uh, my father was like this tremendously serious person. Um, he wasn't always, uh, you know, a chatterbox, but he was salt of the earth. People respected him. I, I looked up to, you know, like it was almost a sense of awe, mm-hmm. right? He was just, and I can, he was just that guy. He was just no nonsense and he was that guy. And um, so he was my hero. Uh, I've always wanted to be, you know, like him. So anyway, I, I go through the public school system. I was a knucklehead uh, towards the ladder <laughs> in high school, ended up in the military, uh, quickly found out that, you know, although I'm proud of my service, um, as I didn't want to do that for the rest of my life, had a divine encounter. Uh, so I'm going back and forth. So my father, like I said, was a devout guy. So I grew up in church all the time, mm. but uh, I did my stuff on Friday and Saturday nights when I was a teenager and stuff. Mm. Uh, so I always had great respect for, for faith, but you know, I lived my life that, and I went from an A student in high school to like a C student. That's how I ended up in the military. Mm. And, um, in the military, I really became a very, very successful uh, backslider. I was having a great time. And then all of a sudden, the, sort of the, the bottom fell out of my world. Uh, I had a Damascus Road experience and everything since I was 21 has been about you know making his name great. And then it's taken me through college, through law school, marrying my wife, my children. Everything about my life has been this amazing, almost Bible story, and I'm sure we'll get into it. So. Hmm. Uh, became a lawyer. It was actually the cool thing about it is so when I was a kid, I, dr- I had two um, sort of role models. And once again, when I was a kid, there was no internet, there was hardly cable when I was very, very young. And you did not see black people on TV at all. Mm. The, the one person I saw as a kid was Brian Gumble. You guys might remember him from HBO Real Sports, but he yeah. used to be like on NBC. You know, he was like the Stephen A. Smith, he was like the Stuart Scott, before he passed away, he was like that one central sports figure that you saw. And so I said when I was a kid, I wanted to be like Brian Gumble, or I wanted to be like, um, um, oh my God, uh, Thurgood Marshall, uh, hmm. who was, you know, obviously a very prominent African American attorney. And so I got to become a lawyer. So I feel like at least I sort of made one of those dreams come true. And uh, so, you know, now I, I, I work, uh, I'm an attorney. Uh, but um, that's just you know what I do is not who I am. Um, I define myself, uh, you know, who I am as a father, as a friend. Um, mm. Hopefully, as a mentor, as a person, people can you know relate to. Uh, but everything has been you know an opportunity to, to uh, grow and to you know show people that God is real. I have to write this book. I, I started writing my book. Um, Biography. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, uh, <laughs> you know, we're gonna get into more detail. But anyway, so that's the arc of my life from the South. I moved up here for law school in 1998. So I've, I've now lived between the military and, and college and you know, law school and stuff. I, I've lived way more of my life out of the South than I did in the South. But I, as I always tell people, if you put a, a plate of grits in front of me, <laughs> the, uh, the, the Alabama will come back very quickly. So. Wait, hold on. Do you do sugar or salt? Listen, man, I see, all that, I see all that stuff is going on. And that, that's clearly, you know, y'all, y'all, people who are not from the South, because there is just no, I mean, you don't put sugar in grits. I mean, that's, 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 that's some foolishness. Man. Oh, so, man. So I probably, I probably get canceled. I put all the above, salt, sugar, pepper, grit, like all of it. Obviously not from Alabama. I'm not. <laughs> no, no. Pepper is salt and pepper and butter. Uh, that's how you all do day. it. Take those straws. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm curious, uh, you know, if we met you in high school, what kind of guy would you have been? You know, where where are you in the stratosphere of that (laughs) growing up? You know, I was, you know, obviously we sort of, you know, you guys asked me some things to sort of contemplate. And um, so I I never fit cleanly in one box, right? Mm -hmm. So I I guess I would say I was a chameleon. Mm -hmm. I was athletic, but where I'm from, I mean, I was so mediocre athletically and I was a late bloomer. I wasn't even six feet tall when I graduated from high school. Mm. I shot up in the military. So I was extremely from where I'm from, uh, mediocre athletically. So I had sort of two iterations of myself in high school. Uh, freshman and sophomore year I was a quintessential nerd. I made all A's, you know, and but then I realized, you know, I'm very logical. 
Like, you know, this is having a, a negative impact on my social life. <laughs> goal. I had none. So uh, I decided to uh, be cool. And so I let my grades go to pot. And then 11th and, and 12th grade years, I was just trying to be cool. I had a car. You know, I was trying to, um, you know, I'm from the era, you know, that, like I said, they had no social media. So if you were going to, you know, uh, have a reputation as someone who the ladies would would enjoy spending time with, you actually had to have, you know, some something for you. You know, you had to have, you know, a car, you had to have, mm. you had to dress a certain way, you had to do all those things. So I, I switched all my focus on that and was, once again, equally mediocre in that. But at least I felt good, like, and uh, so I, I went from an A guy uh, to like a C student, C minor student, and uh, so stupid. But you know, I, in retrospect, it was part of God's plan. So I didn't fit neatly in any category. I would mm. just say I was a chameleon because I was cool with people, but I never had like you know a defining group. I never had a best friend. Mm -hmm. I never had a crew. I, like you know, people always what's up, and I would if we were at the high school parties and stuff, I would have plenty of people to, to associate with. But I just never had like a best friend or, or, you know, I wasn't a musician. I wasn't the band guy. I wasn't the athlete guy. I wasn't the nerd anymore. I wasn't. I was just sort of an amalgamation, a chameleon. Yeah. Mm. Henry, I feel like a lot of guys end up in that spot where, mm -hmm. you know, we, we think that we should belong in a certain category. We had this idea mm -hmm. of like arriving. And, you know, a lot of people feel like, man, these one category doesn't define me. I don't fit right. here. I don't feel here. So a lot of guys end up feeling like alienated. And like, there's something wrong with me. So how did you learn to process that, that not fitting uh, and just embrace who you are? Right. Well, uh, Billy, it wasn't until years later because we all, when, you're, when we're young like that, I mean, that need to fit in, the need to connect is so almost overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So I did not, I just wore a mask like everybody else, you know. I tried to... Um, numb, I won't call it pain, but the discomfort of not having a sort of organic fit by by just, you know, trying to be cool, doing what everybody else did. Uh, but it wasn't until, uh, you know, when I was 21, when I was in the military, when I had my Damascus Road sort of transition that at least I began to see why some of this stuff up until that time had happened and why I was always different. But I would say uh, in retrospect, when I, you know, my, you guys know my son. So my son's in college right now, and I keep telling him, to just keep living. Mm -hmm. You know, it will change. Mm -hmm. But you know, like I said, my father was so much older than me. Um, I, I I didn't have me when I was at that age. So um, it's hard. It's hard for guys, and you know, women are way more. I'm not trying to, you know, traditionally are more open to their feelings. You know, mm -hmm. and we tend to mask a lot. So it's hard. It's just hard. Um, if anybody's that age and they were going to be checking out this, this podcast, I would just say keep living mm. because, um, you know, when you're at that age, it's so hard. And it mm. it's just so hard. Every, and what you don't know is everybody feels that way, mm -hmm. right? Whether they are the captain of the football team, whether they are the head cheerleader, head, whatever, whatever category seems organic for them, everybody feels that way. You just don't know it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll just say keep living because your your time is going to come. Um, a lot of guys are late bloomers, mm. and uh, so that's how that's how I was. But I would I, everything I've learned, unfortunately, has been in retrospect. You know that I tell my children there are two ways you learn: you can learn through instruction or you can learn through experience. Mm. And for most of us, it is always experience. It's always about looking back, you know, and, and gleaning, you know, from 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 that. So yeah. I won't pretend like I had it made or I figured it all out. Mm -hmm. But I know looking back on it now, you know, I think, um, you know, this is helpful. This is useful. Yeah. I'm curious, who were some of the men uh, besides your father, or if there were any, that sort of helped you enter manhood? Or did you have any? Mm -hmm. Right. So I am from a segregated uh, community. My elementary school was all black. My high school was all black. I didn't start inter interacting well, I used to have jobs when I was in high school, so I, mm. I worked at Burger King. So the Burger King I worked at was integrated. But beyond that, it wasn't until I got in the military. So, but I'm fortunate um, that there were so many positive teachers in my high school. Mm. And like I said, uh, both of my parents, you know, were married before. So uh, you guys know, unfortunately, I've had a lot of, you know, lost a lot of death in my family. But I had, growing up, I had older male, you know, 
they were like my uncles. They were my brothers, mm. but they were like uncles to me. Mm. Uh, so I, I had a lot of them. But it's just, you know, my father was so, um, you know, he, I just respected him so much. And I never wanted to do anything that was going to dishonor him. Mm. But I would say that now I didn't have the mentoring. Like my father, oh my God, um, he was born, I always have to do the math. So he was born in um, 1905. Mm. He died in 1998 when he was uh, 93. So the gap between him and me was was like incredible. So we, he, we, he wasn't touchy feely per se, but I just every single day he got up and he did life and he just you could set your clock by this guy. So he was always that guy, always that guy. Um, and I try to live my life. So, you know, for my children to be that guy, um, he wasn't famous. He had a sixth grade education, but everybody in the neighborhood, you know, gave him respect. So he was always that guy for me. And uh you know, all I ever wanted to do was to, to make him proud. Mm. So I, I will always say him. And I would just say I was blessed to have a lot of teachers and, and, and things. But I didn't need, like, you know, um, anybody else to say I want to pattern myself after. Because I, I always said to myself that if, if I worked half as hard as my father, I would be twice as successful mm. just because of the, the society that he grew up in as compared to the society I grew up in. And, and now, though, it's such an honor to know that I get to go back. I, 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 you know, he. I can hear his voice talk about stuff that happened in the nineteen, fifteen, 19, the teens and the twenties and stuff. You know, mm. I can in my lifetime. I can go back to that because of the stories that he told me. But yeah, it's always him, mm. always him. Yeah, you said something really interesting. You can learn from experience, or you can learn from instruction. Yeah. So mm. I feel like a lot of us have that that pain where we, we look back. Experience I remember the key point in my school. life when I'm like, you know what? I remember my dad told me to do something and I'm like, man, I, I don't see it, dad. I'm going to trust you on this. I mean, it was maybe like 14, 15. And mm. if you get this one wrong, though, dude, I don't know where <laughs> we're going from here, but I'm going to do it my way. <laughs> and turns out he was dead right. And I was like, oh, man, my dad knows what he's talking about. So when you look back on some of those lessons, like when your dad would talk to you and you know, what are some of those key lessons that really stuck out to you? A story, something in a situation? Um, what are some of those things that stuck out to you? So my, my dad was very, um, it's amazing. It's amazing. So like I said, sixth grade education, but was the most intelligent person I ever knew. And so he was, he was such a good speaker. Um, he would do things in church from time to time. And he just spoke like oracles. Hmm. And so um, the thing that sticks out to me to him is going to be actually the title of my book. And so this is the first time I'm saying it publicly. Um, but he used to always uh, say, he used to always say this nickname, and I'm not going to tell you the nickname, but uh, I hated it <laughs> growing up. But he would call me and he would say, well, we would always, he was, this man was amazing. So we used to, he used to fix cars. And, you know, when he was in his 70s, he built an extension on our house by himself. He laid the foundation. He did the wiring. I mean, that kind of guy. Mm -hmm. And when he was in his 70s, right? And so I was just the person who held the light or held the screwdriver or whatever. Mm -hmm. He was a great doer. He was a great teacher. So I didn't, I didn't inherit any of that stuff, but I was always there. And he had these sayings. And so one of the things he said, and there wasn't a specific um, uh, experience, but it was a thought process that has shaped me. He used to always say, once again, man born in rural Alabama. Uh, he had great common sense. But he used to say, son, if a bird can sing but won't sing, make him sing. Mm. If a bird can sing but won't sing, make him sing. And that became the mantra of my life. Mm. Because basically, what he, he would always say that when he would figure out something. We would be building something, and by we, I mean him. I would be watching. <laughs> and, you know, he would get stuck. And that was his way of saying, okay, I figured it out. Mm. You know, we can't do this. I mean, literally building an extension onto a house. And so uh, you would get stuck. And when he would figure it out, when he would get the breakthrough, he would say, son, if a bird can sing but won't sing, make him sing. And so uh, that's going to be the name of my book, Making Birds Sing, mm. because it has always been what I heard when I was homeless, when we were uh, dealing with autism, when I was the, the millions of challenges I've had. 
if a bird can see, it was just that, that, that don't give up, uh, you know, message, you can do it. Uh, the great Stevie Wonder said problems have solutions. Mm. A lot of times we get so frustrated in the pursuit of it that we give up. And, and his message was, you know, don't quit, uh, change up, change up your perspective, do whatever you have to do, uh, but problems have solutions and you can figure it out. So it's more than a specific incident, it's a mindset that he embedded in me, mm. you know, when I was young, when I was eight, nine, 10, 11. If a bird can sing, but don't, if a bird can sing, but won't sing, make him sing. And this has always been my approach to life. That is deeply impactful, wow. Yeah. If a bird can sing, but won't sing, make him sing. I, I can imagine being in low moments and being like, man, I'm gonna make this sing. I'm gonna make it work. I'm gonna find a way to win. Mm. I'm gonna figure it out. And just that level of resolve, that level of grit, determination, like, you know, mm -hmm. my dad taught me, make it sing. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to make it sing. We'll make it sing. I love that. And, and thank you for the exclusive. You heard it here first. <laughs> yes, yes. Henry Noy. Okay. Make breaking it news. Sing. You heard it here first. <laughs> yeah. I need to get, I need to go ahead and get all that stuff on social media because I keep saying. Um, we, got yeah, you. Be, we got we, you. We got Henry. you. We got you. Do you have a book cover? <laughs> <laughs> Charles will make one for you. <laughs> it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> that's awesome. Any other things that like that, you know, those timeless truths that, that your dad kind of imparted to you that stick out? Well, I think another, and I, I want to give my mother her credit mm -hmm, uh, as well. Of course. So I've had like some, some real, you know, you guys can relate to this, but, you know, pre GPS, pre cell phone when I was in the military. I was in Charleston, South Carolina, and I would go back and forth to Birmingham. Mm -hmm. Because when I first started that drive, you know, you couldn't just, you know, there was no map. I mean, there was no, you know, phone that tells you turn here, turn there. Yeah. I literally had to have an atlas to, to, to take the uh, connections. And, um, you know, I used to sell maps and books and stuff. And, uh, you know, the first few times I would get nervous because, you know, if you haven't seen a road sign, if you're driving, you know, from you know seven hour drive and you haven't seen a, a, a sign in a few hours, you would get nervous. Like, am I still on the right path? Right. Mm -hmm. So I've had these uh, life lessons um, that have, that reminded me that I'm on path even before I knew I was on the path. And the first started was when I was in the fifth grade. So uh, I have I have uh, I've buried uh, six siblings and both parents. The first uh, sibling I lost was my brother Gerald, who was born with cancer. I was uh, eight years old. He was um, 18. I was getting ready to be nine. Anyway, so I, he, he was born with cancer and we shared a room uh, and I saw him uh, take his last breath. And uh, so because of that experience and people helped him uh, fast forward, I think I was in the fourth grade, so in the fifth grade, and this would never happen today. I can remember being in the fifth grade and I'm just in class like everybody else. And um, the teacher for what they would call special education comes into the room. He talks to my fifth grade teacher. The next thing you know, I get summoned to, to come there. I'm like, what in the world is going on? I remember like this, like it was yesterday. And my teacher come, pulls me outside with the fifth grade, uh, spe with the special ed teacher, who is a man, mind you, he's a man. And they told me, that I had to take Paul to the bathroom. And Paul was this guy who had, we would, we would I wouldn't even use the term that he was called in those days, but that was mm. before we had any concept of being politically correct. But I think he had cerebral palsy. He had significant, severe cognitive deficit. He would drool on himself. Um, he was, he was a challenge. It was very difficult. Um, he would not, he was nonverbal. He, he would draw, I guess he was a student. I guess he was an elementary school A. He just looked so much older to me. Mm. I'm in the fifth grade, mind you. And so they tell me that I, I have to take Paul to the bathroom and I have to take, help Paul with number one and number two. And I go home the first day and I tell my mother, and I'm like, I didn't want to do that. I'm in the fifth grade. Right. And my mother was like, well, people used to help your brother, so you help him. And so for the, that's it. Can you imagine something like that happened in the schools today? Not at all. Uh, for the entire fifth grade year, I would take Paul to the bathroom. I would guide, I would be like, you know, guide him. Cause he wasn't, he, he could walk, but he didn't walk at a fast pace. 
we would go into the bathroom and I would help him throughout the entire process, regardless of what he had to do. Mm. And uh, I couldn't complain because my mother told me I had to do it. I did not like it, uh, needless to say. And it wasn't so much that, I mean, it had nothing... Had nothing to do with his cognitive deficit. I wouldn't want to take either one of you guys. Right. Help you, <laughs> you know, do you imagine being in the fifth grade and having to do that every no. day? So uh, that was my earliest indication that this was just going to be different. Mm. This is just going to be different. And uh, so that life lesson, you know, in the moment I hated it, uh, but it has it has really. Uh, stands out to me now in terms of servanthood. Mm-hmm. It is it is an it is an awesome opportunity to live what Christ talked about. It is it is a fuller extension of washing the disciples' feet. Mm-hmm. We, we do a we do a bad job of understanding that you know there weren't Tims, there weren't Js in the Bible days. So the disciples' feet were disgusting. Mm-hmm. You know, so when Jesus washed their feet, it wasn't like us today. We have you know, like I said, these shoes and socks and all this stuff. They wore sandals. Their feet were disgusting. So what Jesus did was was extremely, you know, debasing and very humbling. And so I got to live that at, at you know in the fifth grade. And that that has definitely uh, that shapes you <laughs> Absolutely. in terms of your life being different. So I I'll always go back to that as being like this, you know, uh, neon light in terms of you know God is going to do something different with my life. And that was my first uh, indoctrination to it. Why do you think they chose you to do that out of all the kids in the school? Well, I think it was because, um, so my brother, like I said, he was eight years older than me. The teacher, I remember her name, and she rest in peace, Mrs. Fox, was my brother's teacher in the mm. fifth grade. She was the lady who told my mother that my brother had cancer, but he also, he had and just developmental delays, developmental delays. And Mrs. Fox, a fifth grade teacher, was the first person to help my mother, uh, you know, with his cognitive challenges. Mm-hmm. And so I think she, she knew that I grew, had grown up in a house, you know, with a quote unquote special needs sibling. And so I think she knew, since she knew my mother very well, I think she probably just knew I had the sensitivity and she knew I, and she knew I, I, I would do it. You know, yeah. my mother was not going to say no. Uh, so I guess, I guess she just knew my history. She knew a little bit about my family. And um, yeah, I, I can tell you every day I became, but listen, I'm, I'm not a, a saint or anything. I hated it. I became like Pavlov's dog. Like yeah. every time around whatever time, you know, the same time of day. And I hated yeah. it. I hated it. But I never complained, but it's just, yeah, I think that was her thought process. Yeah, it's powerful, you know, when, mm-hmm. when we have these experiences as, as children, but mm-hmm. then it sets that, that milestone for us of, you know, somebody mm-hmm. else, a good parent has made a decision for me, and this is the kind of man I'm going to be. And, like, you don't really appreciate that until you get later in life. Yeah. Of, oh, now you understand, you have a deeper revelation of what it means to wash somebody's feet. Like, oh, this is yeah. filthy. Yeah. This is disgusting, but this is what God has done for me. Mm. This is what other people did for mm. my brother. And so this is how, right. while I'm here, I'm going to relate to this world. Um, so that's, that's powerful. You yeah. know, again, at 52, looking back, it's a, it's a story. <laughs> but going through it as an elementary school kid, you're like, God, what please make this? it stop. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Well, Henry, the, thing, the thing, too. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, you know, just thinking about um, going to transition a little bit into your life in the military. I don't know if. Well, what was he about to say first right, before right, well, let's, let's let the man talk. No, no, no. no. I mean, you know, sort of. I, I, I guess the message that I want people to miss is that it's okay not to, not to like it because yeah. these stories that I may share, once again, I'm sitting, you know, in my house in the suburb with my Cleveland Summit and all that stuff. But in the moment, you know, it was it was hard, man. Mm-hmm. And I don't, you know, when people get hardships, uh, obviously we have a, a lot of uh, empathy, a lot of connection with the autism community because of our son. Um, you know, a lot of people are like Job's friends, right? We 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 think that we are being empathetic and supportive, but you know, and another one of the things I always talk about is the whole male gynecologist uh, uh, scenario where you know. A man can can pass the board. He can be a, a 
a gynecologist, not OBGYN, but he's never felt a labor pain. Mm -hmm. He's never lost a child. He never, he never understands the fear and the concern of a mother on that bed because he's just anatomically different. So one of the beautiful things when you go through these experiences is that I, I, I have an, an, an appreciation or experiential perspective uh, that I think you know, can relate to people. And one of the things I always wanna tell people is that when bad stuff happens and you don't understand it in the moment, it is okay to be frustrated. Mm. Dare I say it's even okay to be mad at God. He can take your anger, but just don't let that be something that drives you from him. You know, go to him. This is not, I don't, I can't tell you how many discussions I have led with God by saying, you have not been fair to me. Mm. Now, of course, he's God and I'm not. So uh, we work this thing out. But I don't want, you know, I, 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 I don't like the aspect of Christianity that would suggest that we're supposed to always be happy and, you know, accept what God, you know, no. Some of this stuff is hard, mm -hmm. uh, but he can handle it. Uh, let your challenges take you to him and not from him. I love that. I just got a picture of Jesus in the garden before going to the cross crying, saying, if there's any way for you to take this from me, take it. But any, in any case, let your will be done. So, yeah, even Jesus himself, he didn't want to do it, but he accepted it. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. Exactly. Even Israel, right? Israel mm. means he who wrestles with God, right? So this, this right. whole thing, we're allowed to wrestle with God. And that's a, amazing how God mm. gives us grace to, to be graspable, right? In our mm -hmm. pain, in our frustration, he lets mm -hmm. himself be grasped so that mm. we will know he's there in the discomfort, in the pain. And he works right. through it. And so many Psalms like that too. So yeah. powerful. Thanks. Thanks for highlighting that, Henry. That's really something good. I think a lot of people are experiencing difficulty mm. now because of Corona, racial injustice that yeah. we've seen happen this past or not this year, but 2020. And, and so mm -hmm. a lot of people, you know, have, have bailed, right? Mm -hmm. They've said, it's too hard. I'm, I'm bailing on this God that you've talked about. I'm bailing on Jesus. And so I love your example of just in the, in the hurt, in the pain, let me wrestle this out with God and, and yeah. be real, you know? Mm -hmm. Not just. Well, I know we got to pivot to another thing, but this is such a teachable moment right here, you know, guys. I think I have to I have to give the church an L for part of this stuff because the gospel message that we have that we have uh, packaged to people. I don't know. That's always been true. Listen, I keep I tell people all the time: pick a person in the Bible, pick any favorite character that you that you like. That person caught it. That person went through. Hey, we are in mm -hmm. a fallen world. Right. The love of many has waxed cold. Sin abounds. It's supposed to be hard. The, the, the good part is called heaven. We get that for eternity. And so it's this, it's this sort of uh, fake uh, non-biblical gospel that we have almost by implication peddled to people because we don't get that. The happily ever after. That's a Hollywood creation. Mm. Right. Uh, life here is a challenge. Now, you can find joy in it through Christ, but it is it is not supposed to be easy. Uh, and, and so I, I think when we augment our perspective, you know, we can make that bird sing. Um, hmm. and so it's just the whole concept of, we, 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 we try to merge philosophies, right? We try to merge the happily ever after the rom-com scenario. And listen, everybody, I'm not a, you know, I'm not some kind of, you know, masochist who loves, you know, discomfort or whatever, but it's about perspective. It's about how you see your life. I'm here to make great the name of you know my Lord and Savior. Mm. When I am done with whatever he assigns in my hand, that's when I hear well done. That's when I get my crown, right? So uh, I don't expect, like these guys, I don't expect it's gonna always be easy and comfortable for me, but I expect that he will always be there. Mm. And my job is always being faithful in that moment. Whatever that, whatever that if, it, if it's taking Paul to the bathroom, I gotta be faithful to that. You know, he will he will take he will do with what I present to him. My life is an offering, right? And 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 I need to be faithful in that moment to whatever whatever I'm at. And and then at the end of the day, you know, I'm gonna get, you know, whatever he determines. But I just wanna make just put it out there because I, I hear you, Billy, you're absolutely right. A lot of people are, you know, really going through a hard time uh right now with corona. But once again, if you look at life from a faith perspective, this is just our season. Mm -hmm. You know, this is our time. The children of Israel had that time. The, you know, Gabe loves to use, Gabe is our pastor. He loves to talk about first century Palestine. They had their time. So this is our time. Mm -hmm. And we have challenges in our time. Uh, but this, God is still faithful. 
You know, this is about how you see life, I think. Man, there's nothing more refreshing than a man who knows God, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, there's no way to slice it besides that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we, we talk about this all the time, right? It's about vision. It's about that perspective. Mm. It's, it's embracing the struggle of life. Who told you life was going to be easy? Mm. They're a chump, right? They're, they're, they're peddling you a, a, a product to try and like make you buy something. They're selling you Fantasy. a story that's not reality. And so, yeah, we've talked about that a lot. And especially focusing specifically on men. Right, and, and how do we be men who live with eternal purpose? Mm. It's that so many guys punt on life because they didn't expect mm. to be hard and then they got discouraged right. and like, this isn't what I right. signed up for. Mm. It's like, yeah, right. because you wanted it to be easy, you didn't want to become strong. And mm. then the question is, how do we become strong in God? Mm. And so, man, I love it. Henry, obviously, you know, we, we've, we've talked about this before. I think a lot of, you know, for me, at least my, my grounding in God comes from having an actual experience with him, right. a real moment mm -hmm. where I can point back to and say, Hey, I met with him here. So, you know, can you take us through some of those years in the military and then your uh, Damascus road encounter that you talked about mm -hmm. and point to that, like, man, this is when I had this meeting with God that changed my life. Sure. So, um, one of the great things, even like, I feel like God has spoiled me, even with, I can, I can list out a hundred, no, nah, I can list out 10 or 15 really traumatic, bad things. But on the flip side, I feel like he spoiled me because I got to become the dude that I wanted to be. Mm. Like the best thing about the military, first thing I got in great shape, Lord have mercy, boot camp. <laughs> uh, it was like the perfect thing, perfect storm for me. I had, I had a growth spurt in boot camp. You know, I lost 40 pounds. I got in like great shape. And um, I, be, I got to become that, that, that guy. You know, um, listen, we're, I'm, I'm always going to be transparent. So uh, <laughs> my I, I have always had an eye for women. And so when I was in the military, I got to be that guy. You know, I, I tell guys, uh, you know, pre cell phone, pre, you know, social media. You know, there was, a, there was a time when I had the old school black book between <laughs> Charleston, South Carolina and Birmingham, Alabama. I think I had like 20 something you know, women. Mm. Uh, that I, I could call up and, uh, you know, keep company with. And I used to always dress nice. I had a nice uh, car, had an Audi. Uh, so on, 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 on the surface, I was that guy. I mean, I had, I was in great shape. I was always, you know, quick witted. I always had a way with words, dressing really well, had a really nice car, had tons of, you know, female companionship. And, and I was miserable. Hmm. Um, and there was this guy uh, on, on the ship. I used to play a lot of basketball in those days. And I was an absolute jerk. Like I was, I used to talk so much, you know what? I just, I enjoyed mentally uh, beating you down. I mean, I, I enjoyed the mental part more so than the physical part. And so there was this guy I was playing with, unbeknownst to me, who he really was. He was such a nerd. Uh, and I, I hated him because I couldn't mentally intimidate him. And he was better than me in basketball. And usually if you were better than me, I could psychologically get inside your head some kind of way. Mm. And so we were playing, we used to play and stuff. And no matter what I said, he would just smile. And it was killing me. And it just made me so mad that I could not, you know, uh, break him down. And so, you know, like, have you guys ever bought a car or something? And before you buy a car, you don't see the car that you buy. Then once you buy that car, uh, you see that car everywhere. You see one of yes. those kind of cars. And it's called <laughs> yeah. recency, mm -hmm. recency bias. And so when God really brought this guy into my life, it's like I totally hadn't seen him before. And every day I couldn't, I couldn't uh, get him out of my head. And so we were in the Bahamas. This is, this is my uh, uh, moment. And in 24 hours, like my whole world uh, just fell apart. I remember we pulled in the Bahamas. My ship pulled in the Bahamas. One night, um, how my boys, we were getting drunk, looking for girl, not getting drunk. We were partying with the objective of, you know, hooking up with, with some girls later or whatever. And the next day, 24 hours later, I was on the USS, I keep the name solid, a US naval vessel with the same guy. And we were praying for Jesus to change my life. Hmm. And in 24 hours, um, cause we, we had like the, the second day we had went out to make a phone call. And, um, you know, once again, this is pre-cell phone day, so you had to wait for the phone to be available. Mm. So he and I were sitting there waiting on the phone, and I had never really talked to him before. 
and I'm talking to him and I forget whatever I said. I don't remember what he said or what I said, but I remember we were out in, in Paradise Island in, in, in the Bahamas and I'm crying like a five-year-old baby. And I just like, why am I crying? What, what is, what, what are you doing? Like, you know, <laughs> and he was like, well, listen, do you really have to make that phone call? I'm like, I ain't old to talk to nobody now. I'm crying like a baby. <laughs> so we go on the ship. He tells me that he's a pat, he's a, he's a minister. And he just, just began to, once again, I grew up in church, but he, he, he made it come alive. Mm. And we were in, on this shirt, on this ship where everybody else said, we're not the party. And we were praying, right? And he prayed for the Lord to really come and give me peace. And so in my mind, I'm like, okay, I, I had a weak moment. Um, what's going to happen when we get back to, because my, sh- my ship was in Charleston. I'm like, when we get back to Charleston, I, I got, you know, I got ladies there. I got to go be out. Uh, but I didn't. And we get back and I go to church with this guy. And uh, we go to this Southern Pentecostal church. And I've never been an emotional, like, demonstrative person before. Mm. When any, any, anybody would do that, I was like, you guys are crazy. It doesn't take all that. So we go to this church. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, you guys have seen me in church. So it's so ironic <laughs> now. But um, so I have this, 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 this woman who was praying with me. And... While we were praying, I heard the voice of God that I have come to sense know as God say, if I save you, will you serve me? And he said, this voice said, at this moment, I'm in the military. I told you I made C's and whatever when I was a junior and senior. Mm. At that moment, this was in uh, 1990, the Holy Spirit said, you will become a lawyer and you'll become a, a preacher and you will serve my people secularly through the church and you would serve my people uh, sacredly through the church and secularly in the world. Now, once again, I, I had taken a few college courses, but I, you know, full disclosure, you know, where I'm from, we take the ACT, not the SAT. But I, I was high when I took the ACT and I just took it to get out of school. So I, I made terrible on, on the ACT. I was I, terrible grades, whatever. But the Holy Spirit at that moment in uh, January of 1990, when I was 21, said I was going to be a lawyer. So I was like, okay. I just, I just believed it. It's just, hmm. it just changed my whole perspective. So from that day forward, everything has been on purpose. So I said, okay, well, I got to get out of the military. I had, a, I had almost a year to get out uh, before I got out. I got to go to college some kind of way. And the only reason I got in college, because, and this is how God has been in my life. Even once again, I keep in mind how bad my grades were when I was a junior and a senior, mm. I had taken classes when I was in the military and I had done well in those. So when I was applying to college, they like, listen, your grades from high school are so bad. We're just gonna go by what you did in the military. And they just gave me so much favor. So I got in college wow. like that, graduated, you know, summa cum laude, no, magna cum laude, magna cum laude, um, get into, uh, you know, if I'm gonna be a lawyer, I gotta go to law school. So I applied to law school and along the way, you know, meet Teresa, become more dang, yada yada yada. But even everything, it was it all be it all. This is why discipleship is so important, because it was just watching my friend, watching that guy, knowing that he was different. I saw how he carried himself. I mean, Billy, you know, you're an athlete and everything. You know how it can be in that intense athletic environment. Every kind of profane, mm-hmm. you know, uh, conversations are going on. But he was always different. And I just, I admired him. I admired him because he was, he was strong enough to be different. Hmm. And God used that guy to mentor me. Um, and uh, it was an amazing experience. That's awesome. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I, so, many, so many great things there. You, you mentioned discipleship and just the power of an example, right? I, I heard this quote. Right. It's like, you can teach what you know, but you reproduce what you are. And so, mm-hmm. you know, if you're not a real man after God's heart, you can't, help somebody else actually Mm -hmm. take those steps. You can tell them what it's like, but you can't show them Mm -hmm. how to do it. And so that's so powerful. Just, you know, here you, here you had already had that example before you even know what it was. Mm. So love that. What are you going to say, Charles? Now, uh, random question. Have you kept in contact with him at all? Like when you got out of the military or did you like, what was that like? Yeah. No, no. So here's the crazy thing. And I, you know, I haven't really given his name. So, if you watch this uh, video, so the yes, to answer your question is yes. Now I would love to tell you that he is going on from that and 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 then 
you know, you know, device God. But he's had some challenges in his life. I literally, uh, I guess I got out of the military. I was in South Carolina and he was in, he was in Tennessee. And I, I moved there because I wanted to be near him. But our connection was never the same because he was getting out, ironically, he was getting out of the military three months after, about four months, uh, he got out early in 1990. He got out, let's say April yeah. 1990. I got out in December of 1990. And so for the last four months of his enlistment, that's the only time we got close. Hmm. And we worked out together, we did all this stuff together. And, but the, the connection between us was never the same once I moved there. Now, some of it was, you know, there was a disillusioning you know, because he had some personal challenges. But even that told me, um, you always have to put your, your confidence in, in God. Gabe is preaching on David mm -hmm. today, right? David uh, had this amazing story, but David had some, had some shortcomings. But you always have to look past people to God. And so when I got there, you know, I'm still gung-ho, super on fire. Mm -hmm. And in that, it was just so beautiful. In that last, you know, time of our service, it was a perfect storm for him to be the mentor, the disciple that I needed. But when it came to living, you know, post life, I had to go a different way. But God used him at that moment, you know. Uh, so yeah, it wasn't. I would love to tell you it was happily ever after. We're best friends and we keep in touch with each other. But no, that wasn't mm -hmm. that wasn't God's plan. But in, in that moment, he was the example and, and, and the mentor that I needed. Mm. That's good. People for all seasons, right? Yeah. Go ahead, Charles. Yeah. Now, I was going to yeah. ask about the experience. So after you get out of the military, so you leave the military. Is it you go to law school right after? No, I had, I had to, I had to uh, go to undergrad. Uh -huh. So uh, I went. I started in South Carolina and transferred to uh, Tennessee State University, Oprah's alma mater. <laughs> um, and uh, that's when I, you know, um, th that was hard. I mean, uh, most of you guys have heard the story. So partly, and I made college a little bit harder than it had to be because I'd already been in the military. So I didn't, I didn't want to um, be in somebody's dorm. Like I already lived with you know, dudes on a ship. Yeah. And so every year in college, I just like, I can't, I can't do that. Cause you know, those are dog years. I was, I didn't start college until I was 21 and a half, almost uh, 22 probably, um, or 21. And so, um, you know, I just felt like I, I didn't want to be staying with some 18 year old kid who, never, who hadn't been anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so I always had like, you know, tough, had to work and, you know, find jobs. One year I slept out of my car. It was just crazy. Um, but, you know, I always stay focused because I had that if a bird can't see but won't see, make him sing mentality. And, you know, that was one of the greatest gifts ever because. My whole thing was always, well, if my father, you know, if he did X, I could do this, right? And so I always wanted to, you know, make him proud. And uh, he had no idea. My family had no idea the struggles I, that I went through. Mm. Uh, but, yeah, so college was hard for me just because I always had to work. I never, you know, my family wasn't, they didn't have any money. So I, I used to work at UPS. I worked at... Burger King, managing a Burger King. I just I had full time jobs. Uh, college was crazy. I remember when, one year when I managed Burger King, I, I had classes every day from like eight to one. I would go home uh, or eight to 12, go home like one to three and be at work at uh, 3.30 to like two o'clock in the morning, every day. Mm. And, uh, you know, because I just, I couldn't live, I just uh, it was just, I needed my own space because I've always been different. And plus, you know, coming from where I had come from, sort of pre pre salvation, I didn't trust myself in the college environment mm. in terms of, you know, mm. not living a pure life. So mm. I didn't want to be in that environment. Um, so it made it a little bit harder uh, for me. But you know, God used that time as well. Yeah, mm. absolutely. So you do undergrad, you go to go to law school. What was what was law school like? Is that like finally arriving, and you're you're there, you're with mature people, people who have vision, a little bit more like, what was that experience? You would like to think so. You <laughs> would like to think so. So all right, so the military is very diverse, right? Uh, but law school was the first time 
I had ever been the only black person mm. in an academic setting. Where, where do you go to school? So, Rutgers. Rutgers. Okay. So that was really a challenge for me. Now, mm-hmm. I will say this because I was I, I was married the last two years of law school, but the first year I did live on on, on campus. And on, so that was kind of like my college experience. I was like regular, uh, you know, the regular law student living on campus at Rutgers, playing ball, still doing all that stuff. So law school was fun. I mean, I didn't have to work. Like I worked every year of undergrad, like every year. So I never went to. I went to one football game and one basketball game my entire undergraduate career, just so I could say I went. Wow. Mm-hmm. Um, but so law school was fun, but it was an adjustment from, you know, like now, you know, like I said, I went to a totally segregated, but great in my view, uh, elementary school. We didn't have middle school. We just, elementary and high school was all, you know, all black. And, um, you know, so that it was an adjustment academically. Uh, but I had fun, you know, living in Philadelphia or well, uh, in up in this area. That was, it, it was still exciting. Like in my mind in law school, I feel like, okay, all the hard stuff in life is behind me. You know, I had, I had buried um, only two siblings then, both my parents are still living. I feel like, oh, okay, all that hard stuff is, is, is beyond. And now I'm going to, uh, <laughs> you know, be regular and, and mm-hmm. Now have a crazy life experience and everything is going to be great from here on out. So I was, I was really optimistic in law school. I enjoyed just being a student. I, I got really involved in, uh, you know, I had a great, under, great law school experience. I was involved in leadership, uh, the uh, various bar associations. I got to uh, go and recruit for workers and they used to have these uh, recruitment fairs. I got to put on a little nice uh, suit and, go try to get other students. I did it in Philly, I did it in Atlanta. So I had a lot of favor uh, law school. So I, I enjoyed law school, just it was hard academically. Not because like, if you guys never been law, Billy, you're an engineer and you know, so it's very pragmatic, right? Uh, law school is very abstract. They use the, this, this uh, Socratic method of, of, of teaching, which is just so ridiculous. Uh, and nothing that, that happens in law school prepares you for being a lawyer, right? <laughs> it's like if you were to go to medical school and they ask you medical theory instead of actually showing you how to do stitches yeah. or something. Yeah. So uh, it's very opaque, very abstract. And, you know, frankly, you know, not to make this overly political, but there were changes in the curriculum to, as a gatekeeping process because a lot of women and people who look like me started to uh, pursue the profession and, you know, certain powers that be begin to change it. But... Overall, I love law school. I love only being able to be a student. And, um, you know, I was married, you know, settled and all that stuff. So that was cool. What was the experience like being in law school being, and you realized I'm the only black person here? It was crazy, right? Because a lot of my friends obviously have had that experience and I didn't even think about it. Like. Mm. I was always so in a moment because my life has been this great experience. I went to a historically black college even, and we had white students, but that those white students were me in reverse. And so I didn't give it a second thought. I came up to uh, Rutgers because Teresa was in Philadelphia. And I'm like, well, I'm going to, I, you know, God told me I had to be a lawyer. He didn't tell me where I had to go to law school. <laughs> so if she was here, I had to go be where she was. And so it didn't dawn on me. I, it's, I was just so oblivious. but. I was just so excited because once again, you know, Thurgood Marshall was a hero of mine. I'm mm-hmm. in law school, and I can remember the first day, uh, in, in, you know, in, in the school I went to was a small school, so a big class might have been, you know, 25, 30 students. Mm-hmm. And so now you're in these big lecture halls with 100 kids in there. And I was like, I looked around constitutional law, I'll never forget. I was like, dang, oh, dang. <laughs> Nobody else is black in here. <laughs> and, <laughs> I was like, oh my God, it was, and that was the worst class I had in all of My favorite, this is how, this is how, really how it can impact people. And this is important. Constitutional law is my favorite subject in law school, but I got the worst grade in that class because I was the only, I was the only black person. That, I just felt so different. Mm. Um, every other class, you know, cause we had a lot of black people, but just so in that particular class, the section, I was the only black person. And I did the worst in that class of all of my law school. It's crazy. So that was really, that was, and I was a grown man. It wasn't like I was some kid, you know, I had yeah. been through the military. I didn't start law school 
until I was uh, 27, 26, 27. Mm -hmm. So I was 26 years old. Um, you know, I wasn't a kid by any stretch of the imagination, but it still had an impact on me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was crazy. Yeah, that's got to be a difficult experience for sure. You walk in and especially like the Socratic method, you're debating things and you have one perspective because of your life experience. Right. And now you're like, exactly. You know, what, what am I going to speak up for everybody here? <laughs> so, well, I could. Yeah, I never forget. Here's a funny story from that. So my professor, uh, you know, I'm sure, you know, he used words that everybody didn't understand because he was a law professor. Uh, but he, he had singled me out because I, I was always uh, critical of, um, of, even though I'm a lawyer, I'm like, uh, you know, this is, we're, we're, they, they, there's a reason they say practice law, right? Mm -hmm. I don't care how objective you try to make it, the law is created by individuals through words. Words are subject to interpretation and all of us, this is not math, this is not engineering, right? You cannot make this a absolute science. And so I was criticizing some constitutional, uh, it must have been in the, in the, in the, um, the civil rights uh, component of the course. Mm -hmm. And he and I was I was speaking up because I've I always done that, but I'm the only black person in class. And he says, well, Mr. Noah, you're speaking pejoratively, aren't you? I had no idea what the word pejorative meant mm -hmm. at that time. And I didn't even know what to say because I'm like, what does pejorative mean? And everybody's looking at me and I'm sure I wasn't the only person in there who didn't know what pejorative meant, but I was the only one representing a race because I'm debating about him on, there's a whole line of civil rights uh, cases that you go through in constitutional law, chief among them Brown v. Board of Education. And so I'm just, I'm debating this guy, I had no idea what pejorative meant. And it was the key word in the whole sentence. And so that was, I never forget that that experience. Um, so it's, it's so it's so important to have representation, mm -hmm. uh, especially in education. Absolutely. Yeah, funny story. One of my favorite classes in college um, was contract law, or it was like a, a, a business law class. And he did a lot of like contract stuff and agreements. And I remember sitting in there as a senior, thinking like, "Dad, people get paid to argue with each other. This is great. Like, <laughs> this guy looks like he makes a lot of money that's, too. That's your dream job. You know, <laughs> you know, if, in another lifetime, maybe. <laughs> No, you, you would get tired of it. Trust me. Yeah, I don't think I'd get tired of Ooh. winning if I was good at it. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I guess it depends too what kind of win, what kind of law you go into. Um, but yeah, that's great. So, you know, you're you're in law school. You're you know, we kind of introduced a new character here, Teresa. Yes. Tell us about yeah. this woman of God. You know, how did you guys meet? What's what's this yeah. blossoming relationship that you guys have? Eventually, get married, have kids. So what? You know, right. introduce her to the world. How, how did you meet her? Yes. So, yeah, nothing is normal. You know, a 60 kid whose father is 63, who takes a, who takes his guy with, you know, uh, cognitive deficits to bathroom every day. Um, so, of course, you're not going to meet your, your, your wife in a normal way. I would love to say, <laughs> you know, you met on, on an app or, or whatever. But true to Henry style, you won't believe me, but this is the truth. I saw her in a dream. Uh, so when I was in college, I was managing a Burger King and uh, I'll tell you the real fast version. So the, the, the general, I was the assistant manager, the general manager, was he was tripping. I'm like, dude, you realize I'm in school, right? I'm, I'm not trying to be, you know, get the Golden Whopper award uh, from Burger King or whatever. So he was, he was coming at me and I'm like, are you serious right now? I'm, I don't give, you know, whatever. So I quit. And I quit right around time when the semester was over. So this was in Nashville. I'm from Alabama, three hours away. So I go back to Alabama. Now, I've been managing Burger King all year, so I'm all fat and everything, out of shape, just, ugh, just miserable. And, but I'm back in Birmingham, you know, living, you know, I had a summer job or whatever, but I'm, I'm trying not to be the guy I used to be. So I just had a miserable summer. Um, and I remember waking up Right, it was like in August, right before the time to go back to school. And you've ever been, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you're like you, in the middle of the night, you're not really asleep, but you're not awake, you whatever, whatever. And so I was in that sort of space. And, but I have this amazing dream. I call it a dream, could have been a vision. I see myself, I'm in New York. I'm with this tall African-American woman. She has a fair complexion. She had a white sweater on and she had her, uh, a, a purse 
draped across her body, you know, diagonally, walking down the street in New York. So it's crazy, right? It was like, like this is like, why is this happening? So then fast forward a few weeks, I go back to school. And you guys can't relate to this, but when I went to college, you had to stand online to register. It wasn't like, doo -doo 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 -doo, you know, I'll take this guy. So I had one friend, um, I had two friends when I was in college. One was a professor who just took pity on me because I was like this old guy who, who just, who never fit in, whatever. But I was, you know, I was good in, in the class. And so she became like my surrogate mother. And so I saw her during registration and she gave me a big hug. And it's like, oh, you know, she knew I was a real serious student. So she was like, well, uh, she had just got a promotion. And she's like, oh, I got a new promotion. Uh, you know, come see me, tell me about how your summer went or whatever, when you get down registering. So exactly one week later, I go and see her because every year of college I had to start over. I had to find an apartment, I had to find a job, I had to do all that stuff. Mm. So like one, exactly one week later, I go and I meet her, I meet up with her and like, hey, how you doing? Here, here, how you doing? So I'm at her new office and she's at her desk and we're just talking and she's not really paying me attention. And she's like doing paperwork or whatever. And she's a, she's, a, uh, she's a Christian as well. And I was like, hey, I had this crazy dream a few weeks ago. And, you know, I tell her about this dream. I was like, I see myself, I'm in New York, da 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 And while, all the while I was talking, she was like, not really paying attention. But I started telling her about this dream. She snaps up and she was like, you need to meet Teresa. I'm like, what, who, who is Teresa? And she was like, so her, my, my professor's sister and brother-in-law they pastor like a mega church in Nashville. Like a lot of celebrities used to go there. Uh, BB and CC Winans used to go there. I mean, this is a big deal thing. And so they said that my, my professor was like, well, we went to a worship conference in Texas and we met this girl from Philadelphia who was at the conference as well. And Teresa just so happened to be uh, coming to Nashville that day to visit the pastors and to stay all week. And this was the this was the day before my 25th birthday, and so she was like, "Yeah, she's gonna be staying with my sister, and you should give her a call." And da -da 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 -da, all this stuff. And so, okay, so Teresa comes and visits them. I'm calling like I knew her sister and brother, but I didn't know him, know him. So I'm calling like once again, old school. Nobody had cell phones in those days, and we started talking or whatever. And long story short, we kick it all that all that week, and then Teresa invites me to come up for Thanksgiving, and uh, so we come up for Thanksgiving. The pastor, uh, and I stay at her at her former pastor's house, you know, and so we have Thanksgiving uh, with him. And the next day, Black Friday, we drive up to New York to visit her family, and so we're driving to New York or whatever, and all of a sudden, because I haven't been like I haven't been a player in, in, in a long time, so I'm out of the game. But while we're driving up there, it just dawned on me, like, dude, this is literally the second time you've seen this girl in person over months. You know, we were writing and everything. And you're going to go home and meet her parents? What, are, what is wrong with you? Right? <laughs> so I'm starting to, in my own mind, I'm chastising myself for doing that. And I'm starting to panic, too, because she's like, we're going to Brooklyn. And all I knew about Brooklyn was Spike Lee movies. Like, I'm from Birmingham. <laughs> you know. And so I played it off real smooth. So we, we, we go, uh, you know, for some reason, we, we went in through New York and we go over the Brooklyn Bridge. Like, you know what? It's such a beautiful night. Let's just, let's just take a walk and chill or whatever. And I'm just trying to pause because I'm like, I don't want to meet your family. I don't want to go to Brooklyn and because uh, I'm scared. And all of a sudden, we're walking down the street. Now, we've been together all day. And then we're walking across the Brooklyn Bridge. And Teresa has a white sweater on. And she had her purse dripped across her body diagonally. And we're walking in New York. Teresa's like 5'10", 5'11", in heels. And she has that on. Remember what I saw in my dream back in August. So I'm like, oh, my God, you will never believe mm. I saw this in a dream. And, you know, once you begin to tell her that, and uh, the rest is history, as they say. That's how we met. So her parents loved you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, what, 20 whatever years later, yeah. That is, I don't think I have ever heard uh, this is how I met. This is how I met your mother. Story like that. <laughs> that is crazy. It's crazy, man. It's yeah. crazy. How many months was it from when you had the dream until you actually saw her in person? Yeah. So we 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 had I had the dream in August. Mm. She came to visit uh, the, the people that she met over the Labor Day weekend. Mm. Right. We kicked it uh, 
I don't know what day of the Labor Day weekend she she came, but she, I think she stayed a week. So the entire week, because my birthday is always around Labor Day. Mm. So the entire week she was in Nashville. And I saw her like three or four times. That And I, I know she was here that following Sunday. Um, well, she must have came before. My birthday is September 2nd. She must have came before and, and stayed to the following Sunday. So I, we see each other early September. And then it's just phone calls and letters, because there was no email in those days. Phone calls and letters between the first week in September to Thanksgiving. Mm. So Thanksgiving was the second time I had seen her face to face. That's why I was just like, dude, what are you doing? You can't be going to meet somebody's parents so fast. Right. <laughs> but it was, you know, Man. it was it was to get me to New York to confirm, you know, this vision. And some I'm so oblivious, I'm a dude. Like I said, we had been together all that day. Yeah. And I didn't even put on I didn't put two and two together that she had a white sweater on and we were getting ready to go to New York. It wasn't until we were walking to New York that the spirit brought it back to my remembrance. Like you won't believe, you know. Mm. And all the time it was like, you know, guys, he can sometimes I always tell people, like, uh Moses' story, we're all Christians, and all while Moses is going to go tell Pharaoh, let my people go, the Bible says that God was hardening Pharaoh's heart. So on the one hand, he's telling Pharaoh, he's telling Moses, go talk to Pharaoh. On the other hand, he's hardening the heart of Pharaoh, so Pharaoh won't let him go. So sometimes God closes our eyes or he changes us. So, like, I know Teresa was from New York. Mm. I knew we were getting ready to drive to New York. I knew she had a white sweater on. But none of that stuff resonated until we were physically walking across the Brooklyn Bridge, i.e. in New York City, that everything crystallized and this was the dream. Mm. So it was amazing. It was crazy. Awesome. That's great. We just did an episode on relationships. So would you say that having a dream about meeting your wife is typical or atypical? I think it's atypical. I think it's what that was we the answer I was desperately hoping for. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, I, mean, everybody... I don't think I don't think yeah, I don't think everybody's gonna have that. But once again, look at the stuff that we've had to deal with. Yeah, yeah. Right. You know, and and you know, if it wasn't for like, first of all, I mean, you know. Billy, you're, you're married now. Welcome to the club. So, unfortunately, most marriages now, I mean, maybe 50-50 in the divorce. If you add in a special needs child, which you guys know we had, that number becomes astronomical. Mm. And when you add in all those, the challenges with all the deaths, because, what, four of those siblings and both parents have been since we've been married. Mm. Right? So, that's, that, you know, um, that it's been a lot. Uh, so that was so critical for me because mm -hmm. once again, in my efforts to make the birds sing, uh, and Teresa's very strong will, we, we, you know, marriage is hard, two becoming one is very hard. If, if it wasn't for that confirmation that, listen, dude, you, you cannot doubt that you're supposed to be with her, mm -hmm. right? Uh, because, you know, you know we're, we're human like everybody else. You know, there have been there have been ample times that I've wanted to you know quit this because it's just too hard. Mm. Um, but that is a great reminder to me of what God has done, and um, you know I have so much respect for her at this point. I mean, I think love is is great. I think it's overrated. I don't know what it, I don't I don't know um, the three of us. If we were to if we were to all define it, we would have different definitions, right? Mm. Uh, and it's subjective, but admiration, respect, those are more sort of objective terms. And 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 um, I used to always say, you don't have to like me, but you will respect me. Um, just the, just the, the almost reverence that I have for who she is as a, as a person, um, just, just so makes me want to, you know, wake up and do life, mm -hmm. you know, and so, and I love her, you know, but I just, I just think that uh, sometimes we put the value in the wrong things. Um, just a tremendous, tremendous uh, woman, tremendous, um, just just a beast. You know, I'm, I'm honored to do life with her. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> All Man, right, so, so much, to, so much there. Go, go, Charles. Go. Nah, so I was gonna say, okay, so you meet Teresa, you get married, you're in law school, right? So you're married in mm -hmm. law school your last two years. Um, tell us about the the transition from those last two years of law school. What, what do you do after? So what's next? Yeah, so uh, you got to find a job because you know I was very fortunate. Uh, my law school wasn't very uh, 
expensive compared to most people. Mm. But unfortunately, the way you know the legal education is, most people graduate with a mortgage because law school is not cheap, right? <laughs> so you got to get a job. Uh, God opened up the door. I've seen the hand of God move. So I, I get this job at this one place. And then uh, so I graduated in 1998. I had a job when I graduated. And then in 2000, God gave me another job, causing my salary to double, hmm. uh, which is amazing. That was cool. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> uh, we, so we, we were married for uh, five years before we started a family. And um, it was, then it was time to start a family. And I can still remember another defining moment was um, Teresa gets pregnant. And I forget the third, is it third month or whatever, when you go to the to the doctor for the checkup when they can tell the gender. Mm. Uh, you know, everybody's in the, doing the big gender reveal stuff now. Yeah. Uh, so I can remember being in the hospital, Bryn Mawr Hospital in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania, when the doctor put the stuff on her stomach and whatever she had to do and told me that I was having a son. I mean, I, I literally yelled and ran you know, down the hospital uh, hall, I was so ecstatic. So, uh, you know, I guess I had great reverence for my father, but we, we didn't really, we were so different. Mm. And I was just like, okay, all these great things I'm going to be able to do with my son. And, and that, that is, that's been like all the stuff up until now, you know, Paul, uh, you know, the hardships, uh, post-education, living out of my car in Nashville, all that stuff, the, the death, you know, all that stuff was wiped away. And I, for the, the last six months of that pregnancy and the first year of his life was heaven on earth. I had a great job. I was making high, you know, top of my profession salary wise. I had this beautiful son. I just, that between, so Regal was born uh, 11 and 15, 01. So, you know, if you just, I would say from 2000 to uh, 2001, wherever that whole time frame, mm. that was that was like you know heaven on earth for me because it seemed like it seemed like you know all of the hardships had passed. It seemed like I was in the happily ever after you know uh, narrative that Hollywood sells, and um, you know it was great. But uh, mm. unbeknownst to me, you know. Uh, about two years later, we find out that, that Regal's autistic. Mm. Um, and then here we go again into uh, an unusual, atypical uh, scenario. I can remember working, because I was you know, at the age where a lot of people were starting to have families. I can remember being at all these professional gatherings and listening to my colleagues talk about you know, there's their children in, you know, sports and their children doing this and this and that. And once again, I'm on the outside looking in because my experiences are different. Mm. And uh, it was it was a perpetual grieving. Um, and it was, um, you know, it was one of those times when I talked to you about having those conversations like, God, come on, are you serious? Mm. You know how high I was uh, when I when I knew I was having a son, mm. and and then you uh, then this happens, and so that was that was Henry, circa. So Regal was born November of two thousand one. We got the diagnosis. I was saying uh, two thousand four, two thousand five ish. So Henry from two thousand five until man, at least a decade, at least a decade was just so bitter mm. and broken and mad at God. Like, I'm like, you won't even, you won't let me be great. <laughs> you won't let me be fabulous. You know, I have, Frederick Douglass used to say, and I used to say, Frederick Douglass said that uh, success is not measured by height achieved, but by distance climbed. It can't be about height achieved because we don't all start at the same point. Yeah. Uh, you know. And so I was, I spent a decade just angry. Like, this is too much. The death, all of this stuff. And now, uh, now I have this. And, uh, but me, my son, let's not make it, you know, too, uh, too sad. Mm. 
turns out to be this amazing person. Um, he is, I always, I always talk about the reverence I have for my father. I have that same, how, how awesome is God? I have that same reverence for my son. This guy doesn't start school until the fourth grade. He has the drive of Michael Jordan. And once you get, got him into school, I mean, he graduated from Radnor High School, one of the best schools in the state of Pennsylvania, uh, better than me, uh, summa cum laude. He is uh, right now in college in the Midwest, over a thousand miles away, first semester, GPA was 3.77. Just, I mean, he travels across the country by himself. He flew back. We had been, we took him out there and all that. And he was like, I got this. So he just went back in January, halfway across the country, three, three flights. I mean, he's just doing, he's just doing the damn thing. Um, Mm. Hit the drive, the work ethic. uh, It's amazing. I, I am so reticent to take any credit for it because I feel like I just have watched two amazing people, my father and my son, and I'm just in the middle. Mm. Uh, but he's amazing, man. But once again, now, I'm always 100. I always keep it 100. I, I respect my son immeasurably. I just, I mean, I almost revere him. Not because he's my son, just because I've seen his drive. Yeah. I know where he came from. Uh, but it, I could still, if I had a different perspective, I never played basketball with him, right? When when he was when he was born, I put a basketball and football, got me a Laker jersey. I was a big Kobe Bryant fan. I had a little Kobe, um, Kobe uh, photo over his crib. I had all the footballs, all the basketballs, all that stuff. We never did that. I never did that. Never, never stood in the stands and, and watched him, you know, score. But what I got was uh, was something so different, equally as significant, right? But it's about that perspective, right? Mm-hmm. It's about um, you know, God let me be a part of a miracle, mm-hmm. because most kids who, who get that diagnosis don't end up, you know, where he is. And uh, so it has been the absolute defining experience of my life. All the other stuff was just to prepare me for that, mm. you know. And so now at 52, you know, who knows what is what is left? But just having that experience with him and and my 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 daughter is, uh, you know, amazing. I just I'm surrounded by all these incredible, strong. She is. So, you know, she's not like him. She, you know, he is, uh, he was a phenomenal student. Nia has, she's at the other level where she's a thinker. So she understands, you know, because what we call education is really regurgitation, right? Mm-hmm. You know, the teacher professor tells you something on day one, and then he or she gives you a test on day eight, and you just tell them what they told you the first day. It's just regurgitation. And my daughter's a thinker, though. She's into concepts and, and stuff, so she doesn't, care if she gets a C because what does it really mean mm. uh, but her strength and um, so I'm just surrounded by all these amazing people um, and, and yeah that experience that we've had with him Regal is uh, I mean it's, it's just it's the making of me mm-hmm. and in retrospect um, once again I am telling you this after one of, <laughs> yeah. one of the, one of the, the, the stories of script because I think we I think we do scripture injustice so often how many times have you heard growing up in church or being in church, the story with Joseph and his brothers, the whole uh, God meant, I mean, you meant it for evil, God got a lot of for good. Yep. But we don't think about the fact that Joseph wasn't saying that when he was in prison. Mm-hmm. Right. Joseph was the governor of, of Egypt at that point. He had been sleeping in the palace. So in the moment when we are in prison, we don't say that. When he was in prison, he was begging the guy to help him get out. But it, there, there's a certain aspect of, of reflection that only comes from 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 being past something i think yeah. now the great ones can like paul that's what made paul so phenomenal because in the moment you know paul was like um he wrote you know uh all those your grace is sufficient for me all those powerful second corinthians i mean 
It's the most powerful book in the Bible where he he just goes through all his suffering and stuff. So he was different. He was a different dude. He he did that in a moment. Most people did it in in retrospect, but so I can share with you guys now. Yeah. You know, looking back so you can look ahead. Uh, God is always faithful. He's always turning that stuff. Uh, you know, what is Romans eight twenty? It's true. All things do work together for good. Yeah. It don't. It doesn't feel good. It's, there's not an immediate sort of goodness to it that you can always comprehend as a person who's doing life in that time. But if you keep living, if you stay faithful, if you if you turn, you know, they say that the uh, eye of the storm is the safest place. Mm. If you go in instead of you know running in that moment, he will always show you the good. And I'm honored now. I feel like uh, I remember from when Grant Hill uh, was in his heyday, his father had played professional football. And so his father went from being, uh, Grant Hill went from being Calvin Hill's son and Calvin Hill became Grant Hill's father, right? Mm-hmm. So I, 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 you know, it's my highest honor to say that I'm Regal's father, you know, cause he's that guy and he's amazing. But That's it, didn't, it, didn't, it, didn't, it didn't start out that way at all, trust me. Yeah. What do you think the biggest lesson, uh, what is the biggest lesson that you've learned from being a father? Oh man, uh, to die, die to self, that's easy. That's what Christianity is supposed to be about. Mm. Uh, it is, you know, I, I used to sharing with you a part of this, this story that I had lived, you know, I used to always think and it could still happen, but I have always believed that I was supposed to be famous. Mm. I have this wonderful story to share, right? And so, but once again, it's always different. I keep telling you, I'm 52. All right, I'm like, all right, God, <laughs> uh, I'm getting a little bit too old. You know, <laughs> now would be the time. And, uh, but I, I've learned to, to die to, to any, to any, um, I wouldn't say any, because I'm not perfect. I've, I have, I think being a father means that, you know, my love for for them supersedes my selfish love for myself. And if once again, like I said, if if they are never Henry's children, but I am, you know, Nia's dad, my daughter's a phenomenal songwriter, singer, who knows what God's gonna do with her. She has a tremendous story. I respect her, I'll let her tell her story. Uh, but you know, if I could be Nia's dad or if I could be Regal's dad, if I could be Teresa's husband, right? So um, I would say sacrifice loving somebody else more than you love yourself, being third or being fourth. Um, yeah, just just the whole concept of, um, you know, for God so loved the world, he gave, right? Love is giving, love is sacrifice, love is, love is surrender. Love is making less of yourself so other people can be great. And I think that's what I've gotten from, from being a parent. Wow. That's great. Henry, you know, we, you've, you've mentioned a couple of times that you've experienced a lot of loss in your life. Um, the loss of siblings, of parents, of different trials that you've been through. So could you elaborate a little bit on that and then share how you've overcome that and any, any framework that you've come up with um, for how you approach pain and difficulty in life? Right. So one thing, fear is of full disclosure, I have been uh, I'm a big advocate of counseling. So over the last, I think I've probably been counseling one form or another for, for much of the last two decades because grief is can be crippling. And, uh, and it's so funny too because like I, I don't see a stigma in it at all because one of the things about, you know, when you've lived this life, it's like, you know, Billy, if you were to go to a wrestling match or something, you could see something that I wouldn't see because you're experienced in it. You know, Charles, when, when, when you are in the studio, you and I could be standing side by side, you know, in the studio, and you could hear notes that, you know, would make you cringe. And I'm like, sound good to me, you know? So, um, like, I see things in people. You know, it's like that, that old movie, uh, I See Dead People, right? Um, I see the, the brokenness that you're trying to mask. You're not fooling me. And so I know, and I've said this many times, everybody that I know I've ever met could benefit from good counseling. Now, I would, I would advocate a faith perspective in that counseling, 
because that's how I see life, mm. right? Uh, so that's the first thing. Um, get professional help um, because it is hard. Um, and I, I, I'm not, I will never live a quote unquote normal day for the rest of my life. Holidays are brutal. Um, so this is just one of those situations where Second Corinthians twelve come. His grace is just sufficient, mm. right? I don't I don't have a uh, happy Christmas. I have a wonderful family. I'm blessed. I have a beautiful home. I have all that, but I I still deal with the reality of everybody that I grew up with almost almost being gone. Um, but here's the thing, life changes your perspective, challenges changes your perspective. So I, I look at life from Philippians 3.10 and Paul talks about the, 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 uh, power of the resurrection corresponding with the fellowship of the suffering. And so I understand that there is a certain aspect of brokenness that makes me better able to receive the love of God. And so... I trust him with that, mm. and I try to. Here's here's one quick lesson that I that I will share with people. Uh, giving back, and, and and I'm not the most touchy feely or whatever, but um, I try to pivot really quickly. A former pastor of mine said, "I can't stop the birds from flying over my head, but I can keep them from making a nest in my hair." Mm. So when I began to become self consumed, when I began to become, you know, it's all grief. When the grief becomes present, I try to help other people. I try to take the focus off of me. And I've been blessed that, that I've been connected to a, a lot of people that I can mentor, that I have connections with. Uh, and so I try, to, I try to serve, you know. I mean, there's sometimes that no strategy works. Counseling doesn't work. Service, I'm like, cause I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give you some, you know, happily around this. Some days are just hard. Yeah. Some days are just hard, but you know what? It's purposeful. Because earth is not intended to be heaven. Once again, you have to understand that the narrative that Hollywood, you know, tries to give us is not reality from a faith perspective. Right. Some days are just hard. Some days you've done everything that you can and you just feel bad. And he understands that. And he's present with you in that moment. But I think for me to answer your question, uh, I have, I have uh, had to reshape my perspective and, and reevaluate, uh, you know, how I see life. And I'm just, cause just, here's the struggle. The struggle in all that is you want to accuse God. And this is what the Satan does, right? It's, it's what he did. He came to Jesus and he, he accused him. Um, it's how he, he got Adam and Eve in a garden, right? He, 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 he was subtle and he wants to come to you in your lowest estate to try to tell you somehow that God is not right. That he is unfair to he's been unjust this does not work and so you have to also have a few non-negotiable scriptures and so you have to have you know first of all you have to have a mindset to make birds sing shout out to joe noy secondly you have to have a few foundational scriptures that just work for anything like like a football play it just works against the blitz it works against whatever and romans 8 and 28 is is you it, satan can't mess with that if you really understand that all things work together for good so that in this pain, in this moment, it's working for my good. It doesn't feel good right now. So we have to rightly divide the word. The scripture doesn't say all things will feel good. It says that ultimately, there will, good will come from this. And so it becomes my component to trust him. Mm -hmm. And you can go to God through your tears and scream and agony. You could even cuss in your prayers. And you could say, this does not feel good. You have not kept your promise. And I guarantee you, whenever you come to God, and you put him, his word in front of him, he will respond to you in that moment. Mm. All right. So yeah, Henry, just to follow up, I know in previous conversations we've had, I know, obviously you have, have been through hell and back in different scenarios and in different times. So what you gave us is an incredibly real and mature answer. Yes. Um, for someone who is experiencing grief for the first time, sometimes it's helpful mm. to yeah. give people right. ladders, you know, like, hey, as you process it, yeah. you know, how can I make sense of it? So I know when we've spoken uh, before, you've had the three P's of processing pain. And so um, 
I don't know if that was off the cuff or if that's something you, you could share with us now. <laughs> sure. Uh, oh, my God. Yeah, we talked about that. So processing pain. Um, I think, and once again, uh, we, we are speaking as, as men of faith from, from a faith perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the first thing that, and I, I'll, I'll go back to my first, like I've had shocking death. Um, my first brother, I was nine and he was, he was, uh, 17. So I didn't, I won't even count that because I was just a kid. I didn't understand. I think the, the, the best lesson can be when I was 19 and I was in Europe, in Italy, and my brother, uh, died and I had to fly home from, uh, La Maddalena, Sardinia, Italy to Birmingham mm. to, to bury him. And uh, so it was just a shocking, and this this is this is crazy because it was a um, it was like something you would see on 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 a TV show because I did not like him. <laughs> uh, we 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 did not have a good relationship. My brother was um, a good athlete. He had he had won the Grambling. He uh, played for a legendary football coach, Eddie Robinson, and people who have you know some history of historically black colleges. Um, you know, he was just a great athlete and I was not, I told you I was very mediocre. And he just, he never seemed to um, embrace who I was just because I wasn't a good athlete like him. Mm. And so I didn't like him. Uh, the last time I saw him, we fought uh, verbally because I got, my brother played offensive line. So uh, if, he, not gonna if we had a fall physically, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it would have been a, it would have been a short fall. Short fight, <laughs> so, so yeah, so, uh, you know, I was 19. I, you have no concept and no, no thought that you won't get a chance to make it right. So um, I think, you know, I certainly didn't have that perspective that I have now. So how did I handle it then and, and how I, how can somebody, and I'm sorry, cause I don't remember what I told you. I should have wrote it down, but processing, I think the first thing you have to do is be, be, be present. You have to always be, um, be transparent. So how, what does it mean to be present in your pain? It means that you have to, cause see, here's what the enemy does. He will always, just like all things work together for good, he always seeks to make every experience fatal for you and your faith. And so one of the things that I, that I used to always do is he always wants to connect the dot from whatever pain that you're experiencing in the moment to connect that to something else so that you will give up and you won't make that bird sing. So the thing that I would tell that person is you have to understand that uh, in the moment, you know, this grief is is grief this this is what it is it's, it, it, don't connect it to something else don't use this whether you feel valid and justified in your positioning or not don't use this to somehow justify all the other pain in your life um whether there's validity to it or not just deal with what's in front of you right now the loss of a sibling the loss of a parent the loss of a love relationship god forbid the loss of a child this is what it is right here right now all right trying to divorce yourself from all the other stuff that wants to, the tentacles that the enemy is trying to connect to it. And then you have to, if you are able, uh, cause sometimes, sometimes depending on the relationship and where you are in, in life, you're not able to really uh, fully grieve. When my son got diagnosed, I had a daughter, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, bury my head in the sand. I had to mm -hmm. put food on the table, I had to support my wife, I had to be a parent to my, to my daughter. And I had to try to help recover my son. So sometimes it's just not about you, right? If, if, if you are in a, a parental relationship, if you're in some type of relationship, even if you're younger, sometimes, um, so I said be present, I would say uh, you have to posture yourself, depending on what role that you have to, you know, uh, function in life, and, and then just be authentic. You know, once again, we're talking about from a faith perspective, be transparent, you know, the scripture says that the hairs on our head are numbered. And I love that scripture because, uh, you know, I have none left. But <laughs> it, it says that he didn't count our, the numbers of hairs on our head. He numbered them. There's a difference. So, like, when you get a haircut, 
you know, he knows exactly the ones that have been, you know, shorn hmm. and the ones that, 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 that remain, the ones that are cut off, the ones that are still left. And so God is so into us. Uh, he can take your hurt. He can take your brokenness. He can take your pain. The only thing that he cannot heal you through is if you isolate from him. Mm. So I would say, go to God, be transparent. I'm sorry, this is not alliteration. Uh, and, and, and just deal with the real issue, which is the, the, the immediate loss and resist the temptation, valid as it may seem, resist that temptation to connect the dots. Because I, I went through years of that. Mm. Every time somebody died, I would connect it to all the other deaths. Mm. And so you don't just grieve in that moment. You're sort of reliving all this other stuff that, that is, in fairness, is not connected, right? And the other thing is, you, you, what, what happens is that, for me anyway, it just it has given me a, a, what I think is a biblical uh, perspective of faith in, in terms of our mortality. We, we, we are born to die. I mean, the Bible says that, you know, there's a time to be born. It's a time to, there's a time to die. And uh, God is in control of that. And so it seems unfair to me that my 17-year-old brother, my 30-year-old brother, my 41-year-old sister, you know, that stuff seems unfair to me, but it was just their time, mm. right? And God was now somehow unfair. It was like, you know, um, Billy and you and Charles, uh, you know, try to make plans or whatever, but Charles, has a, he has an appointment to keep. Well, he, he's not going to make, he's not going to be able to see you at that time if he has an appointment, mm. Right. Paul says, is appointed unto us once to die and after that the judgment. So death is an appointment. And I've really, you know, lived in that perspective. So once again, to someone who's really dealing with grief in a moment, get counseling, uh, try to uh, process that pain by being fair to yourself, deal, deal with the one that's in front of you and, um, you know, try to be transparent. So that's what I would say. That's great advice. You yeah. know, I feel like that's, just those three things alone are really going to help take this thing and just like that weight of I'll never get past this out of it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the big things when people grieve is like, this is going to be the end for me. And you brought that out, right? The lie that the devil says is, oh, this is confirmation mm -hmm. that everything yeah. is working for the bad. When in the contrary, right, right. Mm -hmm. it's the like exact mm -hmm. opposite, even though our feeling and, and the reality of that moment is mm -hmm. still present. So. Yeah. Yeah. Charles. Henry, yeah. First of all, we want to just thank you for your time. We yes. have we have a million questions. We're not we even going to be able let's, to. Get let's get one more before yeah. the wild question. All right. Oh, one more. Before one the wild. more. Well, yeah, because we always end with the same <laughs> question. But yeah. we, we heard and I don't know if you're ready for two big releases. We heard through the grapevine <laughs> that you're working on something special with our, our, our mm. fellow man of God, Paulie Z. So <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Is, are we, is this is this too soon to release it? No, or? I. I I told him I told him that this would come up. And, you know, Charles is helping us out. So um, I, I am just uh, I'm very serious and I'm passionate. Um, and I think that one of the best I'm sorry, everything for me is a story. So mm. my former pastor once broke down the uh, deliverance of the nation of uh, Israel out of Egypt. And he said, remember, I told you how God was telling Moses go tell Pharaoh mm. and the scripture says that as he was doing that he was hardening Pharaoh's heart and it wasn't until all 12 of those plagues were fulfilled that they that they uh, released him so if you really examine it what, what, what God was doing there he was defeating all of the idols that the, that Egypt had set up and he was showing them who, who's really who's what and so I feel in my every fiber of my being that 2020 that COVID and everything that we saw from Ahmaud Arbery, uh, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, all this stuff is not circumstance, it's not coincidental. And all this stuff happened in, 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 par in pandemic where we can't turn away. Right. And so I believe that uh, God is, is not pleased with man, man's inhumanity to man as it has manifested in racial terms. And I am not, you know, I'm not wholly pleased with how some aspects of the church has dealt with this. You know, our church is very diverse. Most churches don't have to deal with that mm -hmm. because it's a bunch of people who look like each other who, who go to church. But for the place that we worship, it doesn't look like that. So it's like the, the, the scene from Remember the Titans, 
where, where Denzel's character says, most, most teams don't have to deal with race, but we do. Mm. And so Paul and I, Paul, who is, who's a, you know, a great friend of mine, uh, we are going to begin to have uh, uh, this conversation across racial lines. Uh, and we have also, we've been blessed with, I mean, what can you say about Jessica? I don't know her middle name, Fowler. One of, uh, one one of the most incredible people that all of us know. Yeah. Uh, she's a doctor, but if she wanted to, she could just be another Oprah, right. another Gail. I mean, she's a phenomenal communicator. So she's going to moderate this discussion, and we are going to uh, begin shooting, and we're going to uh, present this overdue conversation. Uh, a black person and a white person, not that we speak for every black person or every white person, mm. uh, but we got to begin to have this conversation. I don't, I don't think that the church has done a great job. I'm just going to be fully transparent. I'm from Birmingham, Alabama. If you go to Birmingham, the uh, probably the best tourist attraction is the Civil Rights Museum. They actually have the jail that Dr. King wrote his letter from a Birmingham jail. Mm. And it is a religious experience. His hand is touched the jail that Dr. King wrote his letter from a Birmingham jail, but that letter was written to white clergy. Mm -hmm. And that letter was saying, y'all haven't done what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, and I think that, but what the hope of it is, what we saw post George Floyd was the streets were filled with all colors of people. As a matter of fact, the streets were more filled with white people than it was with black people. So I'm so encouraged and excited about these beautiful Gen Z, millennial, whatever they call, <laughs> yeah. uh, because they're not here for that, you know? But the problem is, is that older people want to um, not fully embrace the responsibility. And, I, and, 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 and what I saw and what I have seen, the outcome, the outpouring, you know, has been phenomenal. And I think that it's going to be sort of from a ground up extra church movement that's really gonna gonna say, hey, you know, stop all this other stuff because if you don't if you're not really talking about man's inhumanity man as we see it now, you know, through this prism of race, then what are you really doing? Mm. And uh, so we wanna we wanna begin, not begin, but we want to be a part of that conversation. And uh, we actually are we've been working diligently behind the scenes and we're gonna we're gonna put it on wax. Uh, next week, and we're going to try to drop one a month and just model how this conversation, you know, can happen. And we'll see what God does with it. But yeah, I have to, I have, you know, I can't be silent. Yeah. And, um, you know, you guys know me. All right. So I'm, I'm going to give it to you 100. Um, and I don't, I don't really feel like being politically correct. Never disrespectful. Mm. But um, I always say, you know, some, I know we got to wrap it up here, but. Here's one last nugget. I always have a nugget. So there is one instance in history where God was divinely creative. And that was in the Garden of, Garden of Eden, where, he's, where he took nothing and made something out of it. Every other time when God desired to make a, phenom a fundamental radical change, he used people. Hmm. We talked about Moses rescuing the nation, Joshua, whoever. Whoever, show me another situation in the Bible where God took nothing and, and fixed people through it. He always uses people. So people have to take part in this. And so Paul and I are going to have this conversation, hopefully as an example, to how other people can engage. Because uh, and, and we're looking at it from a, from a relationship standpoint. We, we, we've identified 12 key pillars of relationships. And we're going to have that conversation once a month using relationship as the foundation, but how do we have this conversation across racial lines? So it'll be dropping soon. That's fantastic. Um, you guys be on the lookout for it. Is that gonna to be that. on YouTube or where can people find that? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna uh, drop it on YouTube. We're gonna drop it on social media. Uh, so yeah. Awesome. And, and you guys know, they don't know, but Paul is amazing. Yeah. Jess is phenomenal. Yeah, well Paul's on, on the short to, list. We're gonna have him on here, so. <laughs> yeah. 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 We gotta get him soon. Yeah, well. You ready? Yeah, we're ready. Uh, first off, thank you, Henry. This yeah. has been awesome. Uh, no we problem. just scratched the surface. We can't re wait to read your book. We yeah. can't wait to watch the series that you and Paul come out with, Long Overdue Conversation. Uh, but I think, you know, B 
be in the context of relationship, in the context of the communities that we walk in. Mm-hmm. I think the, the kind of fathers of the faith uh, perspective that you bring, the history that you have, uh, could not be more excited to hear how you guys navigate that in the context of relationship, being 100% real yeah. with the history, right. with the ignorance, with the hurt, and um, just excited for what God's doing in our community. And, uh, you know, even Charles and I, our friendship, you know, I, we've talked about how, how God wants to use our friendship to be more than just about us, mm. right? And to right. be a witness to the world that, hey, when we walk in, in real biblical love, these are the lines that we're going to cross, and so this is how we stand together. And so right. uh, just yeah. love the example that you guys are setting. And so I just want to cue Charles up. He, we got one question we ask everybody <laughs> because we're not just trying to be boys that grow old. We want to be men. Right? Um, right. So, Charles, why don't you take it away, man? Yeah, that's our final question for you, Henry. Uh, when did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe laugh. When did you know that you became a man? Oh, that's a great question. Oh, uh, man. So many points in my life. Oh, Honestly, for real, I'm sorry, I know we got, I'm trying to tell the story real quickly. Mm. So uh, my, my first man moment was 17 in boot camp. I had went into the military to be uh, a naval intelligence. I had done really well on the ASVAB, which is like the military SAT. And uh, so, but my recruiter told me to tell them that I never tried uh, marijuana. And he didn't tell me though, since I was going to go into naval intelligence that I was going to be uh, interrogated. True story. So the third week of boot camp, already sleep deprived, not eating, all this and that. I get uh, interrogated by two FBI agents. Um, and they literally, it's just like what you see on TV. I'm in a small room with a light shining. Uh, is there anything that, you know, I'm straight off the farm. I'm 17. I haven't been anywhere. And so they basically got me to admit that I had smoked, tried marijuana. And uh, I lost everything. Mm. Uh, now, boot camp is eight weeks. That was the third week. So I had five weeks left to go. I didn't know if I was going to be prosecuted. I didn't know if I was going to get kicked out. I didn't know if I was going to have to pay a huge fine. I didn't know what was going to happen to me, but I still had to keep up with my train. It was also like a scene from the movie. I was in boot camp. I was, a, I was one of the leaders in the company. They took, my, they took my rank in front of the whole company, treated me like absolute you-know-what for five weeks. I had to go... Uh, all this, I do all this extra training. I had to, they dogged me out. It was like a movie. But I never told my parents. I never told, you know, all I could think about was my father, how disappointed he would be. So the fact that I was able to handle that, because boot camp was already hard. And then to add this extra layer on top of it for five weeks, that was when I knew I was a man. Because I, they didn't break me. I didn't, I didn't, I, you know, God, the favor of the Lord, you know, I didn't get kicked out. And you know, I stayed in the military and all that. But the, the way I handled that at, at age 17 was my man moment, I would say. Mm. That's fantastic. Yeah. Awesome. It'll be a chapter in the book. There we go. <laughs> Listen, we can't wait to read forward it. To it. We'll have to, to have you back on, yeah. go through the book, and yeah. when you do your book tour, yeah. your press release. Bring some highlighters. Yes. In yes, we'll go through go it. Man. <laughs> well, Henry, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate it. You dropped a lot of wisdom here, a lots lot. of things that for us just to reflect on. And if one thing we know we can make, if a bird can sing, make it sing. Yes. But won't sing, right? right? Make it sing. So that's yeah. definitely stuck with us. So, <laughs> Charles. That's it. Henry, just again, thank you for your time, your wisdom, your experience that you're willing to share with us. And, you know, the broader community of all the guys who are, or girls who are watching this also. So uh, just thank you once again. Yeah. All right, man. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Well, we got to end. We, we always end with one last thing. Okay. Go be wild. Oh, what is it? Go be wild. <laughs> we don't want no right. weak men. We don't want no boring men. We just don't want wild men who are going to be strong, live with their why. Go be wild. Go be wild. Right. Absolutely. Y'all stay up, man. All right, cool. Later. Thank you for watching this episode of the Wild Way Podcast. If you enjoyed it, give us a like, subscribe, comment below, or share with a friend. Thanks, guys.